Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson and welcome back to the Spider-Verse Retrospectives. I just want to give a heads up, if it feels like I'm a bit strung up during this video, it's because I kind of am a little. I'm a little on edge because I have tried to record this particular video several times and I've had to scrap each take because for one reason or another, things have just gone wrong. Either I've not felt satisfied while doing it, I haven't felt as into it as I normally do, or I flub up the intro, or I get interrupted, or I have to take a, a long pause, or it's a combination of all of them. Either way, I've tried doing this video several times, and each time I have not been satisfied, so I just really want to get this video over with, and I'm a little on edge while I'm doing it. So, apologies in advance if that ends up affecting the quality of the video, so there you go. But Either way, on Saturday we finally finished talking about the main Spider-Verse storyline. So today, it's time we actually get into the tie-ins, and the first tie-in that we're going to be looking at is the Spider-Verse miniseries. You might be a little confused. Basically, while the main Spider-Verse storyline was told in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man, one of the tie-ins for said storyline was a two-issue miniseries called... Spider-Verse, which I admit is kind of confusing if you said, if you ask someone, hey, if I'm reading Spider-Verse, what should I start with? And then they started recommending this, because it when you when you have a, a storyline called Spider-Verse and then one of the tie-ins is called Spider-Verse, I feel like that's a very easy way to get one or two mixed up. It's, and it's, on top of that, it feels weird that it's one of the tie-ins where the book is titled Spider-Verse, and yet the actual main storyline is in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man. It's like if you wanted to read Crisis on Infinite Earths, but instead of the storyline being told in the Maxi series, it instead was told in the pages of Justice League, and the actual book that was called Crisis on Infinite Earths was only two issues long and focused on side characters. It just, it feels weird is what I'm saying. But, that whatever, whatever. Basically, for the start of the tie-ins, we're going to be taking a look at this two-issue miniseries, and the basic gimmick for the Spider-Verse miniseries was that it was an anthology book. Much like Edge of Spider-Verse, the Spider-Verse Spider miniseries was an anthology about the various Spideys of the multiverse and just kind of showing them in their day-to-day -day lives. Basically, their daily grinds, the villains they, fa they face, and in some cases, how they got pulled into Spider-Verse as a whole. Now, it, doesn't, it isn't that way with every Spider-Man, but it is with a few of them here and there, and it, of course, is what helps tie it into the Spider-Verse storyline. But with that being said, is it any good? Are the stories in this worth your time? Well, let's take a look and find out. Today we're going to be starting our look at the Spider-Verse miniseries, and of course, to start things off, we'll be taking a look at Spider-Verse number one. Now, like I said, because the Spider-Verse miniseries is an anthology, it has multiple stories spread throughout it, so each issue has more than one in it. Basically, so... I'm still going to do, be doing my plot summaries, but I'm not going to be giving my thoughts on each story until I finish talking about all of them. I admit it might feel a little strange as I go through them, and it might feel a little rushed in some parts, but I just want to let you know that's how I'm going to be doing it. It's going to be kind of like Steven Universe. I'm not satisfied with it. I'll change it up when I do the second issue, but there you go. So, yeah, but anyway, the first issue actually opens up with Peter Parker going to the Science Expo. Yeah, for whatever reason, the story actually begins almost just pretty much mirroring the origin of Spider-Man, as we see Sp Peter going to the Science Expo, where he would get bitten by the radioactive spider. And through it all, we get some narration that's playing over it, talking about the lot, the paths we take in life, and how the how th how certain things lead to certain lead to other ends, and so on and so forth. But when the narration starts going into how sometimes something may happen that will cause the paths to, to go off into different directions, well, that's when we see that this ain't the main universe Spider-Man. No, what we're seeing right now is actually the past for Earth-3145. You know, the world where Ben Parker got bitten by the spider. As Sure enough, as Peter is in awe of all of them demonstrating radioactivity in the lab, we see Ben. We see Uncle Ben popping up, and we see Uncle Ben popping up, and Peter's like, "Oh, Ben, what are you doing here?" And Ben explains how he's here to hang out with Peter because nobody else would. So, there you go. Either way, this also leads in. We all. This also kind of leads into the narrator of the story, who, and by which I mean the narrator of this, because this story isn't really much of a story. It's at best just a framing device. And it's the purpose of the framing device is to showcase how we're going to be seeing these stories. In this case, the narrator is the master weaver and he taught and basically it's just him giving narration about how he about how he how he weaves the web of life and uh, how he weaves the web 
uh, weaves the web, god damn it, how he weaves the web of life and destiny and how it shapes the paths of, of everybody across the multiverse, their past, their presents, their futures, who they were, who they are, who they will be, and so on and so forth. However, he also talks about how there are those rare few in the web who have the ability to walk along its skeins, and those people are the spiders, and this ultimately leads into what's going on, as it's through the web of life and destiny, he showcases the tales that we end up seeing in the story, so... Yeah, like I said, it's ultimately just the framing device, so to speak, and I'll get my thoughts on it when we're done. Excuse me one second. Sorry, Chindi was barking. But anyway, now that we have the framing device out of the way, we move on to what I consider the actual first story of the comic, and this one actually showcases a pre-existing Spidey, specifically the Spider-Man of the Marvel Mongaverse, which I should probably talk about the Marvel Mongaverse. It's essentially a thing that Marvel did that, is, that pretty much just showcased... Well, as the title of it implies, the Marvel Universe, but through the lens of, of anime and manga. And, uh, it was weird, to put it nicely. Interesting, I'll admit, and with some in and with some creative ideas, but overall just kind of weird. And just kind of give examples of how the universe operated in it. Basically, the superheroes of this world all were all were centered around certain anime tropes and characters. Like, case in point, the Fantastic Four of the Mongaverse was essentially Neon Genesis Evangelion, with Reed Richards acting as Gendo Ikari, while, the, while Ben Grimm, Susan Storm, and their version of Johnny, named Jonathan, because she was a girl in this reality, all went out and fought giant monsters using essentially amped-up versions of their powers in the main universe. On top of that, you had a... The Avengers were essentially the Power Rangers of this world, which to the point where they even had a giant robot, which is awesome. And for whatever reason, in this reality, the Hulk was a demon from hell who served Dormammu. And the less I talk about that, the better. It's kind of dumb. But that also brings us to the Mongaverse version of Spider-Man. And the thing is, he didn't get his abilities from a radioactive spider bite in this universe, but rather... He's a ninja in a clan known as the Spider Clan, with his Uncle Ben originally being his sensei. However, like many other Uncle Bens across the multiverse, Sensei Uncle Ben was killed. However, he was not killed by a random mugger or criminal that Peter failed to stop. No, in the Mongaverse, he was killed by Venom, who, rather than being an ex-reporter that Peter shamed and eventually bonded with an alien symbiote that Peter rejected, he was actually an ex-communicated member of the Spider Clan, who ki who killed Ben Parker not because of a personal vendetta, but because he was on orders from the Mongaverse version of the Kingpin. And ultimately, which yeah, it's just kind of weird. But either way, yeah, Peter wound up seeing that wound up seeing this after Ben died, and well, let's just say it made him somewhat angry and wanting Venom's head on a pike. However. Aunt May did not want Peter to seek vengeance, and because the spider life essentially killed her husband, she didn't want Peter to be engaging in stuff like that either. So to try and continue on his on to try and seek ve vengeance and justice for Ben's death, Peter just wound up developing the Spider-Man persona so that he could go out and f to try and hunt Venom. Well, also kind of going into the whole superhero stuff, because before Ben died, he did impart upon Peter the whole, with great power comes great responsibility, line that, that, with great power, there must also come great responsibility line that he's contractually obligated to give, and ultimately, and, and at the end of the day, despite his anger, Peter was still a good kid. Again, it was still kind of weird in the same way, but I'll give credit, it did feel kind of fun from the stuff I've read from it. Basically, Spider-Man was also one of the few characters in the Mongaverse who actually got his own solo series, which I haven't read. It's on my list, but it is something I do want to check out one day. Especially since in the Mongaverse, he did meet the, he did meet his world's version of Mary Jane, and she wound up becoming that world Spider-Woman. So, that's also interesting. I kind of want to look more into it. Although, if, based on, if the story in this issue is anything to go by, some things did happen in that solo series that did mess Peter up even more so, so... Yeah, again, I would probably appreciate this more if I had read the story, much like what, what happened with, Sp with Spider-Man Noir when I read Edge of Spider-Verse number one, but I haven't, so kind of going in. So my knowledge is somewhat limited. Excuse me one second. Apologies for that. But either way, the story actually opens with Peter meditating, so to speak. And, well, this is where we kind of get another thing that I might have missed from his solo series, as while he's meditating, he begins dreaming. And in his dream, he's holding the body of his Aunt May, who I'm guessing died in the original Spy in the original Mo Marvel Mongaverse books. 
However, in the in the dream, as Peter's holding May's body, it begins talking to him, talking about how it wants Peter to join them, so to speak. And when Peter begins questioning what she means by this, May responds with the many before her body starts spewing out spiders that begin that begin essentially cons again enveloping Peter. This ends up result, but, but as this happens, though, Peter ends up waking up from the dream as. Something bites him and something bites it bites him and breaks him out of a stupor. He manages to grab it and we soon see that it is a spider. A black a big black spider with white on the back, which Peter th thinks is a is supposed to be a message. As basically in, but again, I think in the intervening time between this story and the original appearance, I think Peter did make amends with Venom because well, apparently they were still both members of the Spider Clan. And base, and I think eventually Venom did. You want that Venom eventually became Peter's teacher. Again, this requires further knowledge. I'm I'm sorry that I don't have it. But either way, Peter did get bitten by the spider. When Peter gets bitten by the spider, he interprets this as a message from Venom, pretty much call, pretty much calling for help. And while Mary Jane doesn't think that Peter should do this, especially since a year prior he gave up the Spider-Man mantle. Well, Peter thinks that he has no choice. His brother is calling for his help, and he doesn't want to just abandon him. As such, Peter decides to pull out his old Spidey jammies and decides to rejoin the Spider Clan, whose temple is apparently located in the snowy in the snowy mountains. So, yeah. Either way, Peter ventures out to the Spider Clan's home in the mountains, and sure enough, once he reaches the temple of the Spider Clan, he has another vision. Only this one is of his uncle Ben. Who is who begins walking into the temple and, and encouraging Peter to follow him, pretty much telling him the same thing that the Aunt May vision did, telling him, "Join us, Peter. There are so many." And Sp and Spidey almost follows him until he runs into Venom, who meets him outside. And sure enough, Venom d Venom is kind of ticked that Peter's there. You see, with as which yeah, even Peter's surprised that he's surprised. As even says, why was like, why are you surprised that I'm here? I got your message, and I interpreted that as come help me. I need I need you. Which Venom responds, no, that was not the case at all. Yes, it was a message, but the message wasn't come here. It was stay away. As apparently, basically something bad something bad is happening, and essentially he wanted Peter, and he he basically. He want, it involved Peter needing to stay away from the Spider Clan, which yeah, because Peter misinterpreted the message, Venom starts calling. It's pretty much call, gives him the rough equivalent of "you're an idiot" because you never dedicated yourself fully to this task. So of course you would misinterpret the the symbol. Symbol you haven't sacrificed enough and all that crap, which gets Peter which gets Peter right mad as he pretty much tells him, "What would you know about sacrifice? I'm out there lo I'm out there losing everything, and you're all just up here and you're just up here doing nothing." Nothing. I've lost so many people, and I just and one of those people. Excuse me again. Sorry about that. But either way, yeah. Peter pretty much calls me. Pretty much sa says, yeah. One of the people I lost has been is telling me to go into that temple. So you know what? I'm going in there anyway. But Venom doesn't want to let him do that. And that's another thing I pre I forgot to mention. Apparently, in the intervening time between in the in the in the solo series, Peter did dis bond with his world's equivalent of the Venom symbiote, which attempted to corrupt him and as such to try and carry the burden off of Peter. It, Venom wound up taking on the symbiote himself, and sure enough, we do see how the symbiote, how he's able to manipulate the symbiote, as he's able to turn it into a badass suit of armor, and tells Peter that he, if he, that Peter truly wants to go into the temple, then he has no choice but to stop him, and so, and so Spidey and Venom get into a little fight, and while Spidey is of course all cocky and arrogant that he'll win this fight, but with but with Venom even telling him this will be the final time they fight, and Peter thinking, "Oh, that's a shame. I always that's a shame. This will be the last time. I always enjoy kicking your ass." Well, Venom immediately show kind of humbles him as he ends up managing to knock him aside with his staff and just throwing him around their around their impromptu arena as if he were a rag doll. Yeah, it's clear that. Peter's kind of outmatched here, with Venom even saying, the last time you were here and we fought, you were my student and I was the teacher. Well, the lessons are over. So, yeah, Peter's not exactly doing so well, and yeah, sustains quite a bit of damage, to the point where even by the time Venom finishes his attack, he's on the ground fatigued with his costume ripped up. However, he still wants to get into the temple, because, again, Uncle Ben is imploring him, so he believes that something important is in there. Well, as such, Venom decides, fine, if you're going to go in there, then I have no choice. And so, Venom ends up morphing his hands into a spear, and fully intends to stab Peter through the gut. However, before he gets the chance, Peter actually gets some unexpected help, 
as several web lines come out of nowhere and hit Venom and suddenly wrap him up in a cocoon. As such, as Peter begins regaining his faculties and, and, and starts getting up, we, seen, we soon see who his aide was and what the visions were referring to specifically. As standing in front of the Spider Temple is the Spider Army, with the temple door now be, now a portal, and the Spider Army, the Spider Army beckoning Mongaver Spider-Man to join them. Which I assume he says no to because the because by the time he actually appears in set in the said Spider Verse storyline was when was when the Amazing Spider Man Anya Corazon and Spider Gwen were recruiting Spideys from Japan. So I don't know, whatever. But that's one that's one story done. The next story actually sets up a Spidey who is introduced specifically for Spider Verse, and this is one that we've actually met before. Or the very least, one that I've been referring to. Case in point, this story is the origin of Lady Spider, who, yeah, I have mentioned briefly in, re in relation to Spider-Man 2099, but this story is her debut, and actually does explain her deal. But case in point, she's an alternate version of Aunt May. Sort of. She's a younger variant of the character. Very much a young lady in her prime and not even married to Ben Parker, to the point and at which, as a result of that, her last name is not Parker, it's Riley. And she lives in New York in the late 1800s, specifically the 1890s, and, well, she is pretty much a woman ahead of her time. While society expects her to fit into the norms of everything, well, she doesn't feel like she's fitting that she fits in, and even finds the whole the whole high society that she's a part of to be restricting, limiting, especially if you are a woman. And well, she doesn't like that. However, what makes her this world spider person is well, like many other spideys, a spider bite. Basically, in this real basically she in this reality, May was the daughter of a well of I'm guessing I'm of. A, I don't know. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. But basically, in this, re it's clear that May's family is a bit well off, and so much so that her father actually. Hold on again. Sorry, I had to stop my dog from doing something. But anyways, like I said, May's father was clearly well off to the point where he actually apparently had like several pets. One of which was a spider. Thing is, though, May always felt sa sorry for the spider to be kind of always locked up as it was always as it always was living in a cage. As such, one day, fe feeling guilty for the spider's predicament, hold on again, again, sorry dog stuff, but either way, yeah, May felt sorry for the spider, and in the midst of that bit of, a bit of sorrow and empathy, she decided to open up its cage and reach in to pet the thing. Unfortunately, the spider decided to take advantage of an opportunity and wound up biting May, causing her to pull back and for giving the spider the chance to escape. However, unlike many other universes, the spider was not radioactive or mystical in nature it was just a plain old spider and its bite was not even venomous may did not get superpowers from the bite it, she most likely just got puncture wounds however this was the impetus for what led to what led to may becoming this world spider person because when the spider was free it taught her a lesson never let anyone cage you and as a result of this she felt inspired so to speak which is good for her because well she's apparently very intelligent as well she may try to well, as well she is still pressured to fit into societal norms she has found ways to branch out in her own regard to the point where she actually has attended university and has three degrees some of which are in mechanics and it's what and it's in that degree that she actually puts to use as inspired by the spider's example she ends up creating her own spider sona, so to speak, taking various car parts that her that she had lying around, which it's implied that she used to work on cars when she was younger. Though the car garage got closed when her father died because her mom didn't think that ladies should be working on engines, and basically using that knowledge, she was able to create a suit, basically a backpack, this little backpack that she wears that, when activated, would sprout mechanical spider legs, and from them. And from there, she wound up creating an entire costume from that, using aviator goggles and a ma and a hat and a hat and a aviator hat for a mask. She wound up turning her she wound up using a corset, a red corset, and putting it with a spider outfit, wearing a flight suit, boots, and of course, as any good spider person should have, web shooters. And from these, she finally she wound up taking on the mantle of <clears throat> sorry, food digesting. She wound up taking on the mantle of Lady Spider. 
And the story itself actually is her debut, as her family is holding a ball and... Put simply, she's not excited to be there at all. While her mother presents her as this gr as this wealthy dower heiress that, ev that everyone to fawn over, well, she'd rather be anywhere but here. Which even the which even this world's version of Harry Osborn notes, because yeah, he's in this world too. And he, which yeah, because apparently they're friends. They actually know each other because they went to as they went apparently went to university together. However, thankfully, May does get an excuse to run out of the ball because, well, let's just say balls bring out the crazy people as the lights in the ball grow, go out and we meet this world's version of Electro, a man essentially, who essentially is a guy wearing a regular, a, a third, a, a thir I think, a, 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 I, forgot, I forgot the term, I forgot the term, an insulated suit with electrical, with, that is rigged with electrical, with electrical, what? Electrical, with electrical bolts that elect which he can filter through his gloves. And he is here for the mayor. Why? Because the mayor actually has plans for a new subway system for the city, and, well, Electro wants to get his hands on it. As such, he kidnaps the mayor, and to make sure no one follows, he electrifies all the doors and locks so no one can run after him. Unfortunately for him, well, May has other means of getting around, as in the midst of the confusion, she runs out of the ball and changes into her spidey jammies and goes after him. As such, she manages to confront Electro on the on the build on the roofs of the buildings, and while they do have a brief tussle, May is thankfully able to beat him able to beat him with some well placed web shots and save the mayor. Unfortunately for May, it turns out Electro didn't come alone, as as on the rooftop, she, May is ambushed by steampunk versions of Craven the Hunter, the Vulture, Doctor Octopus, and the Green Goblin. It's kind of awesome, actually, but even, but even May surprised to see them there, as apparently all, she only heard rumors of the of the costume villains of the costume villains teaming up, and she's wondering what their plan, what do they want with the mayor exactly, or why would they, why do they want his plans, so to speak? But either way, she's able to thankfully fend them off as Doc as she managed to outmaneuver Doc Ock's tentacles, and even managed to get the and even managed to get the jump on the Green Goblin and the Vulture by by web by shoot by shooting a couple web lines at a water tower and causing it to fall on them. And as such, in the midst of all this, the sixth supervillain shows up, in this case Mysterio, who instead of having a bubble on his head is wearing a diving helmet, who immediately asks if they, if, if they got the plans they needed. But unfortunately, in the midst of the battle, the subway plans got fried by Electro, so yeah, this whole thing's kind of a bust for the, for the group. As such, Mysterio tells Lady Spire that she may have won this round, but there will be, but they will once, but they will clash once again. And she has not heard the last of the six men of Sinistry before he uses his before he uses his illusion stuff to get to give enough of a cover for this for the for the supervillains to run away. As such, the mayor thanks Lady Spider for her help. Asks her if she says the city is in her debt, and she said. She pretty much she pretty, she just Lady Spider decides that she has to go back to the ball to keep up appearances, especially since in the midst of that battle she did get a good look at the Green Goblin's costume and wouldn't you know it his corset kind of resembled that of 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 Lord Osborne with the same jewel in it, bit of a coincidence wouldn't you say? But either way she said. Either way, the story ends with her swinging away after the mayor gives his thanks, and May monologuing to herself how she's never felt more free. So, there you go. But after that, we get to our third story, and this one's more or less just kind of a gag story, and because well, the Spider-Man in it kind of sort of a gag character. So if you've read old comics, you know how, of course, they like to have ads in between pages here and there. Like, sometimes they're advertising, like, a race car or a video game or something or other. Well, some famous ads are of ho or, or for snack cakes, Hostess fruit pies especially. And these ads are essentially little mini comics. And how they typically go is that a super is that superheroes from, like, Marvel or DC would encounter a threat that, for whatever reason, they can't handle via the conventional means. And only can beat them through the power of hostess fruit pies, which they can, which they use to either distract civilians so they don't get caught in the crossfire, distract the villains so they can go in for the coup de gras, or get the bad guys to surrender altogether. They were silly, weird, and fun, but I can't admit, I won't deny that they had some kind of charm to them. As after I, as even after seeing enough of them, I did want to try and get hostess fruit pies. 
I regretted it, but I did it. So I'll, I'll give them credit. They have charm to them. But ultimately, the, but ultimately, I guess they didn't have enough charm because sadly, that that that's, that world Spider-Man is the next one on the chopping block. As this, as that story actually opens with him trying to go be is on his way to on, to a day with MJ. And in one hand, he has a bouquet of flowers, and in the other, is a bag with all their snacks. So he can't exactly web swing at the moment. However, as he's on his way to the date, he kind of he ends up getting distracted because well. He's, he's, he's the target of the Inheritors, specifically Moreland, who makes it clear that he is here to eat him. As such, Spidey, going with the tried-and-true classic of fruit pies save the day, chucks all the hostess fruit pies he has in the bag at Moreland, hoping that will distract him. But Moreland just goes straight for Spidey and sucks out his life force, with, Spy with Spidey's last moments wondering why he didn't go for the fruit pies, so... There's that. But the story after that is, is longer and less gaggy, well, sort of, and more, I guess I can say, adorkable. Basically, the next story focuses on another Spidey who was created for Spider-Verse. But this one's, well, kind of more pure and innocent. In this case, this story, the next story focuses on a, an 11-year-old gender-bent version of Peter known as Penelope Parker. And in this reality, well, as you can guess, because she's 11 years old, her story is set in elementary school with her cast of characters, with her regular cast being like other students in her class and so forth. And the story actually opens with her and her class on a field trip to a, to a science lab. And of course, the head scientist giving them a lecture on radioactive rays, which, which yeah, Penelope is just as much of a bookworm as her main universe counterpart is, and it does cause the other kids to tease her, even the ones that are her friends, like this world's version of Mary Jane, who in the middle of said lecture takes Penelope's notes and tells her, oh, why even taking notes? We're obviously gonna get a worksheet from Miss Craven later, which, yeah, their teacher is a female version of Craven the Hunter. Make of that what you will. But either way, yeah, in the midst of all that, Penelope is, of course, wanting her, wants her notes back, and MJ does eventually return them, but in the midst of the struggle, Penny, Penelope wound up getting a small little visitor, as just like in many other universes, a spider wound up getting caught in the radioactive rays, and it ends up biting Penelope, causing her to freak out and fling the spider to the ground, where it is promptly stumped underfoot by this world's Flash Thompson, because he is a small ch because he is a small child and a boy, and boys like that kind of gross stuff. Either way, yeah, either way, yeah, once the demonstration is over, the class does go on its way, leaving Pen Penelope alone to pick up her notes, but of course, just like with many other Spideys across the multiverse, the the spider bite does end up giving her superpowers, of course, which of course includes proportionate strength, speed, and agility, we later learn a spider sense, super spider hearing, which she only learns about because MJ is calling for her outside, and outside the building, all the way from the parking lot, and she can somehow hear it, and her own organic web shooters! Which she learns about those because, well, she ends up spouting web from her wrist and it go and it attaches to her notes, causing them to fling everywhere and sadly to also get in her hair, which does leave her in a bit of a sticky situation, so to speak. Either way, she just immediately freaks out upon having these powers because, well, she thinks that they're just wrong, they're gross, they're freaky, and she thinks that other people learned that she had these powers, they would treat her even more of a, they'd be treating her as even more of a social pariah because, well, they already treat her as an outcast already because she's the smart girl, and she uses words like social pariah. So she thinks if they learn about this, she would be even more of an outcast. As such, she decides to try and keep them secret, and after she gets herself untangled from the webs, though, except say for her foot because it got caught in a garbage can, she meant she joins her class outside. However, upon going outside, she wonders where Flash is, and MJ just says, oh, he's off to go, to go do something impressive. You know how boys are. And sure enough, to confirm this, Flash has taken the opportunity to climb on a giant structure surrounding the lab, which their teacher tells him to just get down from there because he could get hurt, and it's an expensive piece of art, so he shouldn't be messing with that. But as Flash is climbing down, the Hand of Fate decides to intervene, and he almost, and he does end up slipping and falling. Thankfully, he does manage to grab on to the top of the structure before he, so he doesn't hit the ground, but his grip is slipping, and it's clear that he doesn't have a lot of time. As such, while Miss Craven goes off to get help, even Penelope and MJ realize that the help's not going to be arriving in time. And that is till Penelope realizes something. She can do something. She actually has, she can actually stop this and save Flash. However, because she's still freaking freaked out about people learning she has spider powers, 
she runs off and decides to create a disguise so no one will recognize her, taking her lunch bag and cutting out holes in it so she can put it on her head, and grabbing her hoodie and wearing it so th and wearing it with the hood hiding her ponytail. As such, as Flash ends up falling off of the structure, she ends up swinging back in and saving him before he be before he becomes Pete before he becomes a splat on the ground. And it does lead to kind of an adorable scene where both Penelope and Flash blush as they're so close to each other. But but thank but Penelope does manage to get Flash safely on the ground, and he does ask her, "Who are you?" And she's, "Oh, you know, just your friendly neighborhood Spider Girl." Before she swings away with Flash clearly smitten. However, the comic then, cu then cuts to later that night as Penelope's back at home, and she's telling the whole story to her Aunt May, who is clearly having trouble taking is having trouble taking it in. As while she's talking, as well she's petting Penelope as she, as Penelope is telling her the story, but her expression is just like oh shit, like she has no idea how to actually reg how she has no idea how to register any of this. However, her mo despite all this, she is supportive of Penelope. And while Penelope thinks these spider powers are gross and freaky and a curse, May Aunt May assures her that they're not. They're actually that she thinks that they might be a gift, so to speak. Which again, another little funny thing I like about how with her, with them showcasing how she's having trouble accepting this is that she struggles is that she has trouble thinking of the word gift. So that's kind of funny. But either way, she does try to encourage that she does try to encourage Penelope that these powers are not a curse; they're a blessing, and she can use them in ways that she may not even expect. Though Aunt May does does warn her about telling Uncle Ben right now, as she doesn't think as Aunt May thinks that she he probably wouldn't understand. But either way, Aunt, but either way, Penelope is just kind of a little astounded, like, well, "How can you just accept me like this? How can you be okay with this?" And Aunt May says, "Because we love you. You're our family, and we try to do our and we try to do our best by you and teach you to do the right things. And you clearly show that today. You couldn't have chosen not to save your friend, but you did. You say we wouldn't be around if it wasn't for you. And I'm proud. And we're proud. And I'm proud of you for that. And so, basically, inspired by her Aunt May's words, Penelope does decide to embrace her freaky spider side, so to speak." and decides to develop her own superhero identity, as after she draws up a few costumes, she ends up putting one together from some leg warmers, a tutu, a shirt that she has a spider on, and apparently an old luchador mask that her Uncle Ben used, that her Uncle Ben had lying around. And so, she becomes her world's version of Spider-Girl, swinging her way off into an adventure that I don't think we'll ever, ever see, so... There you go. But either way, the final story of the issue actually focuses on the... News strip Spider Man, which yeah, if you know how you know how how newspaper strips sometimes have those like strip those comic get those comic strips in them is usually like something that you can I guess updated every week or so. Yeah, that's the universe we're focusing on this time, and that actually opens with this world's Peter Parker and MJ just kind of sitting down to have a picnic. However, peace does not last as as just as they're about to have food, Morlin pops in ready to kill this world's Peter. However, that's when the gimmick of this universe comes into play because because of how the comics are because of how the comics are arranged like news strips, every single like layer of, of of comic panels is arranged like a strip. And so every time a new one begins, it's like you're starting to read a new strip. And because of the nature of new strips, sometimes they gotta repeat information to keep their readers in the know about what's going on. And in that case in the in the case of that well, it also leads to Peter and MJ repeating information. As the instant Moreland appears and calls par and calls Peter by uh, calls Peter by name, Peter uh, Peter MJ talks about how oh we were just having a picnic and this guy showed up. And Peter's like, who are you? Who are you? And how do you know who I am? And it's like I'm Moreland Parker and I'm very and I'm and I'm very hungry. But then immediately in the next set of panels, pa Peter once again says, who are you, man? It's like tell me who you are and how do you know who I am? And Moreland once again says, I told you, I'm Moreland. I'm here to. Wait, did you did you just say that? And it just keeps going with Peter repeating the same thing over and over. And Moreland is just astounded, like, what are you even? What's going on? Why do you keep repeating yourself? Are you brain damaged? Is there no short term memory in this universe? Which it, it, it's kind of funny. And see, but either way, Peter does at least. But either way, in the midst of all this confusion, Peter does run up and try to give Moreland a punch. But Moreland being an inheritor, it does nothing. However, Moreland is not concerned about that, as he's trying to figure out what the hell this universe's gimmick is. And he soon finds that, as apparently, because of its nature as a news strip, time keeps resetting in this universe. And as a result of that, the simplest of actions, like talk, like having a conversation, as we have here, can take weeks, months even, to get done. And so that's why Peter and MJ keep re that's why Peter and MJ keep repeating the same information over and over. However, as Peter and MJ are cowering because they don't know how Peter how, because they don't know how Peter is going to beat Moreland. 
the universe starts fading away around him, which even Moreland's like, okay, what the hell's going on? Weaver, can you explain this? And so the Master Weaver pops in and tells Moreland that the, the universe is just chronally unstable and collapsed in on itself. As such, he asks Moreland if he would like to just visit another universe, but Moreland has kind of had his fill of dimension hopping and decides to just go and take a, to take a rest. However, the instant Moreland is out of earshot, we soon learn that the whole chronal, un, chronally unstable excuse was a load of bull. It turns out that the Master Weaver just thought this universe was too pure, just too pure, and decided to just hide it away in a strand on the web somewhere, acting as kind of a small act of rebellion to make sure that the, the inhabitants of this world would not get pulled into the Spider-Verse, so there you go. But overall, what are my thoughts on the issue? Well, like with Edge of Spider-Verse, I think it's a very, I think it's a lot of fun. Like with Edge of Spider-Verse, it does all, it's very cool to have all these unique and different takes on the tale of Spider-Man told in one story. And what, yeah, they're all smaller and more, and kind of quick around, and kind of quicker, but they operate on the same basis, essentially taking the, uh, the story of Spider-Man and filtering it through these different, and filtering it through these different lenses. And all of them, in my opinion, are really interesting and unique. So I think I should, with that in mind, I should probably talk about my thoughts on each story. As I mentioned, the beginning story is really just a framing device for the miniseries, with the Master Weaver talking about how talking about how he sees the skeins of the Web of Life and Destiny, and how it allows him to peek into the worlds and see the spot and see the spiders, those who walk along the web, and so forth. So it really is just there to act as a framing device. I admit it's a cool introduction to the story, especially with how the Master Weaver talks about the nature of the multiverse and how all it takes is the smallest alteration it can cause a new path to open up and, and go into patterns that are both unique and beautiful, which I like. I, that's one of the things that I love about the multiverse, the analogous nature of reality just just parting ways and going off in a different direction. Because even if something can go wrong, I find it so intriguing to see how the littlest actions can result in an entirely new world. And case in point, we see that here as the, sto as the story we start off with, is the story of Spider-Ben, showcasing that up to the point where his world changed, it was a very familiar story. But all it took was one little alteration, the addition of one extra character, and suddenly the whole thing gets turned on its head. I find that interesting. Otherwise, though, it's just ultimately just a framing device. There's some good artwork in there, especially the scene when the Master Weaver introdu does introduce himself and sets up the whole thing with the spot, uh, the whole, all the spot, with him being able to view other worlds through the web of life and destiny. You do see little snippets of other worlds in the web, including showing that one of the Spider Men that died during the Spider Verse event was the one from the Spider Man Rain universe, so that sucks. But it is still, a it otherwise is just the framing device of the story. Cool opening, I admit, but I wouldn't really call it a story. It really is just an o it's just really just an opening narration, and that's all it really is. But it's a cool it's a cool opening narration, so I dig it. As for the mon the Marvel manga for the manga verse Spider Man story, this one is fine. Kind it's in a similar vein to the Spider Man noir story that we got in Edge of Spider Verse number one. It's just they're gonna kind of act as a little continuation and showcase how this particular Spider-Man got pulled into the events. Again, there's some continuity errors between it and the Spider-Verse storyline, especially since, like I said, during that storyline, Mongoverse Spider-Man didn't join until, like, much later, and yet, when you see the Spider-Army, it looks like they're still in the middle of recruiting the various Spiders for their army. But at the very least, it still feels nice. It does really feel like... It, it, it does feel have a sense of mystery to it, especially as the Mongoverse Peter starts having visions of his Aunt May and Uncle Ben telling him to join them, that there are so many of them. And ultimately, what I, and ultimately this does implore towards the Spider Army and how they're looking for new recruits, as it turns out that the thing that... Venom didn't, the reason why Venom didn't want Peter to go into the temple and go into the spider clan was because since the inheritors are going around the multiverse hunting spider people, he thought that if Peter got involved in this, it would put the spider clan in danger, so he wanted him to stay out of it. So I kind of find that interesting, but I do like the sense of unease and tension throughout the story because you're never given any straight answers for how things are go until you see the spider army come in. When Peter comes in, Venom is tight-lipped and telling him you should not have come here. He sees the visions of his aunt man Uncle Ben encouraging him to go forward, which I find interesting. It does really, it actually does feel like a like an anime plot in a way, especially as Peter go, especially when you see Peter donning a parka and go and venturing out to the mountains to follow the visions and still getting less answers than when he started, which does lead to a short but pretty cool fight between him and Venom. 
one that he ultimately loses, but still. Otherwise, though, it's still just a fine story. Again, cool to get kind of cool to peek in more into the universe. I like seeing the I like the tension of it. I like the mystery. I like the action, and I do like how, and I do like how it all gets answered when he turns out that he was just getting that he was just being prepared for the spider army to come and recruit him. Though, again, if we're talking about continuity errors, another error in the story was that the one of the Spideys in the army was Bullet Point Spider-Man. Although, when I first read the story, I didn't recognize him because they got the colors wrong. But, so, yeah, there's that. As for the Lady Spider story, I think it's honestly a grand introduction to the character. Really damn cool and creative. Basically, she is a steampunk Spider-Woman. Because, unlike other Spideys in the multiverse... She doesn't have superpowers at all. At a later point in these tie-ins, we she it's confirmed that she is not a spider totem. She can mimic a spider. She can mimic a spider totem with her costume and so forth, but she's not a spider totem. She's her world spider person, but she ain't her world spider. But there, but she is not a spider totem. With that being said, though, I do like the creativity in it. I do like the the whole idea of this of the spot of this sp kick ass spider person being this wealthy lady about town who has to keep up appearances but just hates it the whole time. I like that we see I like that we see that side of her and her creativity. Yeah, there's some things about the story that could, that could do with show don't tell as they talk about her mechanic. As they talk about her, as they talk about her university degrees and how she went to university, and how that she hated it, but we do get a sense of her character, and she is, and she is ultimately kind-hearted and can, and maintains enough of us being hinted of appearances so that her family isn't embarrassed. But ultimately, she does have her own acts of rebellion when she forms the the Lady Spider costume, and admittedly, it's pretty kick-ass. It's a pretty good outing and does showcase just how mechanically inclined she is and how creative she is. Again, like all of her Spideys in the multiverse, she does try and she is she does operate in creative ways. Like when she faces Electro, like she immediately like when Electro attacks her party, she notices immediately that he electrifies all the entrances, and so she knows I can't go up this this way. Good thing I have this Spidey. Good thing I have these web shooters on me and as such she manages to supplant that which yeah before you start pointing out the plot holes of how can she swing on web shooters because odds are if she was a normal person they would strength they would she would probably tear her arm off well to that i respond with she made mechanical spider legs you don't think that she would have done something to her to her to her wrists or arms so that she would brace herself for that so whatever either way it also showcases that she is not that she is not stupid. As when she battles the six men of Sinistry, she is able to pick up on little things. She does. Man I like how she finds a way to outmaneuver Doc Ock and how she manages to take down Green Goblin and Vulture by not only taking advantage of their arrogance, but just utilizing her environment to, to, to her advantage. Which I think is a, I think is nice. Which another thing I love is the designs of the six men of Sinistry. Like I said, they're all steampunk versions of the Sinister Six. Like I, look, Craven actually looks like a legitimate hunter from those times with a little monocle and dress and flying around a ship the green goblin has just like a, a standard mask the standard mask with a goblin design to it though and his glider has a jet engine the, the doc ock rather than having the octopus arms directly attached to his back operates them via a fuse box the vulture just seems to have a glider and i already mentioned how the green i already mentioned how how mysterio had a diving helmet inside instead of a bubble ultimate so Overall, it's just fun. It's ultimately just a fun story. It's just there to help showcase the environment that this kind the set the spy the set lady spider up. And I think it's a good introduction. It's a nice little. I do think it's a nice gimmick having offer giving us a steampunk version of spider of Spider Man well, or, Sp or Spider Woman, Lady Spider, whatever. Either way, it's cool to see a steampunk spider in the mix. I think it's done well. Well, showcasing how not only she operates as a superhero, but how the villains kind of operate in a similar manner. It's cool. I dig it. Has some fun action. Showcases May's showcases May with May's character well. Overall, fun story. No, fun story. No, not, and that's all it has to be. So, there you go. As for the hostess fruit pie story, which is apparently called Late for a Date, I admit I think it's kind of funny. It's some a bit of dark humor, admittedly, and it does kind of feel a little mean spirited to kill off the hostess fruit pie Spider Man. But admittedly, I still find it kind of funny to just see this version of Spider-Man just kind of hot-footing it around, trying to make it to try and keep up the appearances for his day with MJ, only for the supervillain to appear who doesn't follow the conventions of the universe. Because immediately he's like, because immediately when he says, "I am here to kill you and feast upon you," and he's like, "Well, feast on this," and throws the fruit pies at Morlin, and Morlin just like no, and just goes right for him and sucks out his life force, which. The story ends by acting like that's what they were advertising. Like, spider totems are delit- Like, hold on, let me see if I can find it. I know- It's actually pretty funny. 
Let me see if I can find the direct quote, if I can just find the right issue. Uh, this is, again, why I need to bookmark these things. And here it is. It says, you get a big delight in every bite of spider totem. Such, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the inheritor's ad. But, yeah, it, it's stupid, but I think I actually enjoy it. As for the Penelope Parker, as for the Penelope Spider Girl story, it's cute. I can't deny it. And yeah, I like cute, okay? I can like cute things. I don't have to be all testosterone manliness all the time. But it's just an adorable story. Penelope Parker as a character is adorkable. She is a she is a she is a sweet little girl version of of Peter and it shows. She's a, like she wear like she walks around in a big in a in an oversized shirt with, with with the sneakers that are sneakers that she obviously has trouble tying. The the glasses look adorable on her. I love the brown little ponytail she has, and her and her friendship with Mary Jane and Flash is it's sweet. I love seeing I love seeing kid Mary Jane messing with her, and it's clear that Mary Jane isn't doing it to be malicious or anything. It's just cute little teasing. It's adorable, but at the same time, she does have her share of of, of moments that are just I guess I could, for lack of a better term. Precious. I love how she reacts when she realizes she has spider powers because I think that's how like any little girl would react in that situation. They wouldn't think, "Oh my god, I have superpowers! This is amazing." They would think, "Oh my god, I'm a freak! This is gross! I won't want anything to do with it at all." It's really just kind of funny, and I kind of love how she roll how she kind of rolls with it. She isn't asking how how this how any of this works. She's immediately thinking the ramifications of it and how it could affect her career, how it could affect her social standing, so to speak. But it is just but but then but at the same time. It also showcases just how, that at the end of the day, she does look like many other versions of Peter. She has a good heart. As immediately when her classmate is in danger, she she even though she's still afraid what people will think with her, she does she puts on a disguise and goes to save him because it's the right thing to do. Again, the disguise is so that no one will recognize her, and so she doesn't get further ostracized. But you can't deny that that's still ador that isn't adorable. So I'll give so again give you that. That's some sweet stuff, and that's pretty much what the whole story is. It's just sweet it feels so innocent in that regard like i'm just gonna say this right now we never see penelope outside of this comic she is not a part of the big spider's event and to my knowledge i don't think she has a solo series after this which i think is to our detriment because i think it would be a really good i think it would be really cool if we got a solo series surrounded about that centered on penelope parker and her adventures i think it would be adorable something that i think it'd be a, good, a nice little cute kids comic because i think because all the building blocks are set up here her character her friendships her personality everything is there and i think it would work well if put into a comic book so i think it would work well but again the whole story is just innocent sweet and just full of heart there's nothing too big about the story it's just the story of a little girl who gets superpowers and doesn't know what to do with them she freaks out about them thinks they're creepy and weird but at the end of the day she decides to still use them for the for good and at the urgings of her aunt she decides to embrace them and decides to just kind of accept the side of her which I think is a story that kids can have in these day and age. Essentially learning it's okay to be the weird kid every once in a while because maybe you can do something good with that weirdness, so to speak. Especially when you see with Pe with Penelope, which again she wants to hide the spider powers away, but well, but she learned, but then she, but when but at the urgings of her aunt, she realizes maybe these aren't as bad as I think they are. Again, it's sweet, it's nice, it's innocent. I do love seeing the interactions of all the characters. A Penelope herself can be just downright adorable. I especially love her reaction when Flash switches the spider. She's like, oh, you didn't have to kill it. That's uh, just that's just sweet. That's just sweet. I, and it, it, it's it, it's just full of saturated sweetness too. Again, when she grab when she saves Flash, she's just blushing. She's just blushing under her paper bag, and even Flash is just obviously smitten right from the get go. It's adorable. It's just cute little it's just cute puppy love it's adorable it's freaking adorable that's what the story is it's adorable and i love it it gets me right in the feels and overall i think i think if the story if the story was picked up and put into a solo book i wouldn't be against seeing it it'd be kind of, i think it'd be sweet and kind and i like that so but as for the final story a similar get similar thing to the hostess fruit pie story it's just silly and stupid and i think the most i think the best part about it is just how moreland reacts to the comic strip universe having it constantly be reset on him going what the hell's going on what's wrong with you why do you keep repeating yourself are you brain damaged i don't know 
For some, that's just funny in that regard. And while Peter and MJ are just not even noticing it because this is their universe, of course they wouldn't notice it. And Mor just the way Morland's reacting, like, what the hell's going on? At the one point, he even forgets that he's supposed to be hunting this world spider person as he just tries to comprehend what universe he's walked in on. He's just like, what's going on here? Why does this keep happening? It's just, again, it's short and sweet, and the ending, ultimately, I think is nice. I do like that we actually, that at least, that... The Master Weaver essentially decides, no, I'm not going to let you hunt this world and does something small a little act does something small to essentially ensure that the inheritors won't be able to get it. It's again just fine, nothing great, but just kind of a but just kind of a funny little just kind of a funny little me setup as Morlin enters this world and just has to try and wrap his head around how it operates. So I dig it; it's fun. So yeah, overall though, issue one. I think it's fine. I, get, it's, I think it's fun. It's, again, the same thing. It, it offers the same thing that the Edge of Spider-Verse miniseries offered us. Just all these different unique takes on Spider-Man and how and seeing it filtered across all these different realities and stories. Seeing it seeing it showcased in all these different mediums. And I think it works well for the most part. Again, first story was cool. Just kind of... The first story was kind of cool, just but ultimately was not really much of a story. Just kind of meant to be the framing device for the rest of the book. The Mongoverse story was fine. Just kind of offering a nice little bit of mystery and showcase Facing how Mongover Spidey might have brought, been brought into the event. The Lady Spider story kicked ass and was and ha had a very unique idea with the Lady Spider and how she got pulled and her general setup. The Hostess Fruit Pie story was stupid and a nice little gag. The Penelope Parker story was adorable and sweet and just kind of chock full of all that, all that hokey, all that all that hokey stuff that just gets you right in the feels. And the final story. It was again just kind of it was just it was a cathartic to see Moreland kind of go at, try and figure out what the hell was going on. So overall, issue one, fun time overall. Just kind of cool peeking into all these universes, seeing their world spideys, and either seeing them do their own thing or get pulled into Spider Verse in some way. So I dig it overall, a lot of fun. So yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you for watching. I hope I was able to suitably entertain you with this video, and I hope to see you on Thursday as we look at issue two of Spider Verse. The tie-in, not the storyline. So again, hope you have a good night. I'm Samuel Johnson, and I'll see you on Thursday. Take care.